Hello and welcome to News Click. We are going to take stock of the year 2018 with Paranjay Guhata Gutta on what have been the most important issues that he sees for this year. Paranjay, let's take first the issue of institutions because we have seen a lot of institutional crisis from the court to the CBI to even the uh, statistical organizations, CSO. Not to mention the Reserve Bank of India. Not to mention the Reserve Bank of India. How do you see as the major, shall we say, uh, issues of confrontation with the government, if you will, and also the aftermath of this confrontation and what does it bode for the future of these institutions themselves? Let's look at what has happened in the year that has gone by, which has never happened before. We've had different kind of crises over the years in the judiciary. We've had judges being superseded. We've had all kinds of comments and allegations. But never before have we had a situation of the kind we had in January 2018. Four of the judges who were the senior most judges just after the Chief Justice of India addressed a media conference, a public conference. Judges don't talk to journalists while they're serving judges. And they pointedly criticized the then Chief Justice of India, Justice Deepak Mishra, saying the manner in which he was constituting the panels or the benches of judges as the master of the roster was objectionable. And in fact, the argument was he was keeping the most controversial, uh, controversial according to the government, issues to his bench. And, 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 and to judges who were perceived to be sympathetic to the ruling dispensation. The three of the judges, Justice Chelameswar, Justice Madan Lokot, Justice Kurian Joseph, have all retired. And Justice Ranjan Gogoi is the Chief Justice. Current Chief Justice. And we've never had something like this before. It's unprecedented. So it was, in fact, a moment of crisis for the court itself because the Supreme Court has been uh, also been under attack for, shall we say, the way it has conducted it, itself on various occasions, the kind of selections it has made, how much it has backed its own selections when the names have been returned. These are all matters which are festering with the Supreme Court, but this is yes. a very unusual occurrence. Yes, you know, in the past too, there has been criticism of particular judgments. There have even been allegations of corruption against the judiciary. The question of how do judges select themselves? Who judges the judges? These are issues which have been debated and discussed at some length, but never before as, what do you would say, like a revolt played itself out in the open. That's how the year began and what a way to begin. Do you think that the Supreme Court has got over this crisis or it still remains? To some extent, the crisis is not over, perhaps. You know, uh, the judiciary, especially the apex court, is an institution where, in which ordinary people have a lot of faith. Now, it depends on which side you're arguing. You could say the so-called revolt of the four judges eroded the confidence of ordinary people in the judiciary. You could also argue that the faith of ordinary citizens had been getting eroded over a period of time, which culminated in this kind of flashpoint. At one point of time, people were wondering what would happen. Would the then Chief Justice of India, Justice Deepak Mishra, uh, uh, actually recommend the name of the next senior most judge to Gogoi. succeed him. But finally, Justice Gogoi did indeed succeed him. And time alone will tell to what extent ordinary citizens' faith in the judiciary remains uh, more or less intact. There, there has been an erosion undoubtedly, but hopefully uh, not so badly eroded that it cannot be repaired. And compared to the other institutions, and I would come to the, shall we say, the end of the year crisis of the CBI. The Central Bureau of Investigations called a caged parrot by the Supreme Court earlier. So what has happened to the caged parrot? Again, unprecedented. Here is a police agency considered to be the premier investigating agency in India. And it's an armed wing of the government. Absolutely. You know, it's not just any other agency. It's one of the armed wings of the state itself. 
never before have you seen the two senior most police officials heading this agency first their fight out in the open trading allegations of corruption against each other never has this happened before finally in a amazing decision that took place after midnight both these two individuals were quote unquote suspended and another person put in charge and we really don't know finally whether mr alok verma who is still officially the director of the cbi will be reinstated in his position before he formally retires at the end of january now what had happened was it also raised into the uh, it uh, raised questions about the manner in which these appointments were made after the whole vineet narayan case we had the cvc the central vigilance commissioner being the sort of a supervising authority over the cbi but that too and the manner in which the cvc acted raised more questions than provided answers also the fact that the you had the cbi head being sort of retired in advance or suspended or we could call it transferred whichever way language you want to use but without actually the chief justice who is supposed to be consulted on this matters being also consulted so the authority which appointed verma with the cbi uh, director is not the body which took the decision to remove him right. and also it seems that the nsa mr doval played a rather important role in the decision which on which he has really no role you know many many have argued that perhaps mr ajit doval has become the most powerful individual of his kind you know like once again let's take should we call it an extra constitutional authority <laughs> that's a difficult uh, a difficult to say because all of this is under the surface nothing is out in the open unless you have some sort of a nuremberg trial and you call mr doval and he's interrogated we might never know the full truth but the point is let's understand they have been very very powerful national security advisors mr brijesh mishra combined in him i mean he was both the principal secretary and the national security advisor in the past too there have been differences of opinion between the director of the cbi and others there have been allegations against both remember this is also the first time in the history of this country that two former directors of the cbi are being investigated by the same agency they headed so yes there have been allegations of corruption there have been all kinds of allegations but never have these differences never have been allegations been out in the open in this way in this manner you've had senior of officials of the enforcement directorate uh, raising allegations about with the finance secretary you know the the enforcement directorate being described as an extortion directorate in a petition in in a court petition by a former dig who's been transferred uh, from the cbi so so whereas differences of opinion uh, rivalries factionalism within these agencies have existed including leaks but never before is it so up front out in the open parij i'd like to just draw your attention to one more thing Astana had six cases against him earlier. Now, now there's supposed to be only one. Artia is only one, and the the what is that biotech? Uh, Sterling biotech. Sterling biotech seems to have disappeared out of this lot of cases, and there are people who are supposed to have disappeared from India with about thirty thousand crores, Absolutely. owing to the banks. You're talking about Sterling biotech. One of the notable features, I mean, the way in which 2018 began. was the biggest ever bank fraud of its kind involving the punjab national bank with with diamond dealers like uh, nirav modi and mehul choksi again you know this is unprecedented you had bank frauds before but this time it was being investigated by the cbi mr astana had been sort of put under the lens because of his daughter's marriage the bills that uh, sterling biotech owners seem to have been uh, footing and the fact that suddenly he once uh, once all this is over he ups uh, and takes goes out of india with 30000 crores owing to the banks absolutely and 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 you look at that 
it started some time ago with Lalit Modi and Vijay Malia becoming absconder. You add to that list the, the big diamond a, traders. This is one of the cases against Mr. Astana. Who's that's the, correct. And that's no longer in the list currently. We, so don't, know, we don't know what's happened to these cases. Happened and these where. Cases. But on this whole issue of uh, Mehul Choksi, Nirav Modi and Jatin Mehta. Again, you talk about non-performing uh, non assets. Winsome Diamonds, also known as Suraj Diamonds, uh, is one of the biggest, uh, has owed a huge amount of money uh, to, the, uh, to, these, uh, to the public sector banks and banks in general. And all these three individuals, some of them are in London, somebody has become a residence of Barbados, somebody else has become a, a, a citizen of St. Kitts and Nevis. The short point is, they're not in this country and they're unlikely, unlikely to return in a hurry, even as the government has made a, you know, raised a hue and cry and made a big deal out of trying to extradite. Malia. Yes, my schoolmate, Mr. Malia, and, and hoping that he'll be able to come back. But I, I don't know whether he, they'll be successful in, in, in this endeavor. Yeah, it's, anyway, it looks like the judicial process is not going to be that quick. But at least in the case of Malia, they have apparently made a reasonably good case in the court. But if we look at this particular CBI issue, it still remains uh, a open sore and we don't see a closure. Like the Supreme Court, at least it tided over. Uh, this doesn't seem to have tided over. No, it's nothing. Ongoing. Yes, we don't see any closure yet. Far so from we, it. We see oh, it's only ongoing. The crisis, the crisis seems to be only... <clears throat> ongoing. Coming back to the other institution, other was the major uh, tension, shall we say, with the Reserve Bank. And it seems to have been on two counts. One is taking out the regulatory powers of the Reserve Bank on issues which are what, what would be called the digital fintech companies, financial uh, companies which operate with really apps and other things. So essentially trying to take those transactions or the regulatory powers for those areas out of the Reserve Bank purview on which Viral Acharya had come out with the open statement saying it's money, Reserve Bank deals with money, therefore you have to have only one regulator. The second, as we discovered later, was with respect to the reserves that the Reserve Bank has and therefore asking that a significant part of these reserves be given to the government for its financial uh, year, which of course is also the election year. So do you think that the Reserve Bank crisis, which led finally to the uh, resignation of the Reserve Bank governor, this again is unprecedented. Reserve Bank governors may have resigned earlier, but not in this okay. kind of crisis. Never before since the case of during Pandit Nehru's time, when T.T. Krishnamachari was the finance minister, Benegal Rama Rao had quit the post of the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. The first time since then. And TTK Krishnamachari was a big cri crisis later, as you remember. That was the, 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 the Mundra, Haridas Mundra crisis. Mundra but I'm saying before that happened. And Nehru stood by his finance minister rather than the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. There have been differences galore between finance ministers and reserve bank governors, but never before have we seen this kind of a, uh, what should I say, uh, this kind of a difference of opinion playing itself out. Now, what is very, very significant, like Mr. Alok Verma, who was appointed by the government, he was an appointee of the, I mean, he was appointed by the, by, by the appointments committee of the cabinet. So too was the governor of the reserve bank of India. Both took place under the Modi regime. Yeah. More than two years ago, before demonetization, Dr. Urjit Patel had replaced Dr. Raghuram Rajan as the head of India's central bank and apex monetary authority. Now, interestingly, he suddenly put in his papers a little before the outcome of the assembly elections, the uh, assembly elections, we can discuss that on the 11th of December. Two or After three. the votes were cast, but before the, uh, yes. the decisions. Over the and above the points of friction that you mentioned, one was about, you know, the payments issues of who regulates digital payments. And the second issue was how are the reserves of the Reserve Bank of India to be used by the government, how much should be given. Two important points should be noted. 
There were sharp differences of opinion between the Reserve Bank of India, the country's central bank and apex monetary authority, and the government of India, the Ministry of Finance, on issues of the prompt corrective action on banks, particularly public sector banks. Not only there, the declaration of financially stressed assets as non-performing assets so that they, those issues can be resolved uh, under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code by the National Company Law Tribunal. Among them were major power companies, including the companies set up by Adani, Adani and Ambani, Ambani SR, etc., etc., etc. But Tata's wait. as well. Absolutely. But let's again look at something else. Dr. Urjit Patel replaced Dr. Raghuram Rajan, soon after he became the governor, we had demonetization. And then he was perceived to be a person who supported the government wholeheartedly on a very, very controversial, highly disruptive decision. Which Raghuram Rajan had opposed in his term as governor. Absolutely. And not only that, I'm here drawing a parallel between Alok Verma and Dr. Patel, Urjit Patel. Both were government appointees appointed by the Appointments Committee of the camp. Both were perceived to be, rightly or wrongly, they would be, quote-unquote, loyal, quote-unquote, subservient to the Narendra Modi government. And we found both, in their own way, thought that enough is enough. Never before, as I said, something like this has happened. And today, the gentleman who has replaced Dr. Ujit Patel, he was the face of demonetization. He, as the in the finance ministry, was the person who kind of supported demonetization, as is the person who replaced, who, who, who replaced Dr. Arvind Subramaniam as the chief economic advisor and is currently the new CEA. So these critical appointments, which were always, uh, you know, you had this facade of these organizations being autonomous and independent, but they were always political appointees. But I never before, I can argue, has the appointments been made in such a contentious and brazen manner. Well, Mr. Shakti Khan Das, apart from being in the IAS, senior IAS officer before he retired, was also a man history and some Somebody has quipped that I hope that he will not make RBI also history. So we can hope that all these institutions, whether it be the Supreme Court of India, whether it be Central Bureau of Investigation, and the Reserve Bank of India would be resilient enough to withstand the shocks and the turbulence that has, uh, had, they've had that has been inflicted on these institutions, I should say. I, I, I'm really hopeful because these are institutions. Their individuals come and go. Every Governments come and go. But these are very, very critical institutions. And the more ordinary citizens lose their faith in these institutions, the worse it is for every person in this country. You know, Dr. Pranab said came on to News Click, as you know, for a discussion on the Central Statistical Organization. And he, he made a very important point. He said, you know, you can have policies which the government makes, but the evidence must be independent. That should not be informed <laughs> by the government's policies. Because if the evidence is also tainted, then the policies have no meaning. And uh, CSO has also been, uh, shall we say, also a victim of the credibility crisis of the institutions because it's back series which it uh, prepared seems to have been, shall we say, uh, how do I phrase it, doctored in a way to show UPS growth as lower than NDA. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense if we take all other economic data into account. And also what Professor Dr. Mandel had done, that he had prepared a back series for the GDP, once that you have a change of method of computing GDP, which showed what would be expected from other economic indicators. Do you think this is also another blow to institutional crisis that we see under the current regime? Undoubtedly. One more institution has been undermined. As you rightly pointed out, as Dr. Pranab Sen rightly pointed out, 
every political party will take certain decisions. You will slice and dice the data. You will cherry pick what suits you to arrive at, to justify whatever policy you have. But the data itself, you know, we know that calculation of gross domestic product, they're in, imperfect. It's based on sampling techniques, based on extrapolation, based on a whole lot of assumptions you make. You change the methodology of calculating these numbers. Then when people asked for the back series, you appointed a committee and then you start nitpicking and then you have the Niti Aayog which has replaced the planning commission together with the central statistics office which finally releases this data ostensibly to show that the performance or, 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 or in terms of the rate of growth of GDP, the current regime, the, the Narendra Modi government's performance is better. I mean, again, I feel sad as a citizen of this country to acknowledge but never before have data, evidence been so brazenly been sought to be manipulated for narrow political gains. Handmaiden of everyday politics. You know, last question I have, have a few because we can go on for the year much longer. Do you think that all of this, finally, the test is what the people feel? That all of this, whatever you may do with the data, whatever the institutions may say, ultimately it's a people who speak. Do you think this elections, the mini general elections, which people have called in the semi-final, five states out of which three are the Hindi-speaking states. And as you know, BJP won most of its uh, two, 82 seats from the Hindi heartland. And these three states which went were all controlled by the BJP. We went to the polls, were all controlled by the BJP. Do you think people have spoken their mind about the kind of institutional crisis which has been imposed in the country and of course on the livelihoods, the farmers crisis, all of these issues for which data is sought to be doctored but the reality is there in front of the people. The Indian voter, she surprises us every time. However much we like to personalize politics, Modi banam Rahul Gandhi or what Modi was in 2013-14 and where Modi is today. The short point is, I think the issues that resonated, the issues that mattered most to ordinary voters and ordinary citizens, the crisis in rural India, the agrarian crisis, the farm crisis, two, the inability to create jobs for young people and the impact that decisions like demonetization has had on the economy. I think these are among the very, very important issues that matter. And I can add one more. The, the attempt that has been made to divide this country along religious lines, I think there is a section of ordinary voters who are seeing through this game by political parties and politicians. And for them, when they vote, they make a clear choice. You know, we can rationalize and we can say, you know, politics is a choice between the lesser eagles. All politicians are the same. All parties are the same. Typical middle class reaction. I know, but the ordinary voter, she knows, he knows that some things will not change, but still they vote for change. And I think the coming four months are going to be very, 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 very crucial perhaps even more turbulent than much of 2018 has been, with the Earth Kum being sought to be converted into a Maha Kum. How much religion can play is a question. How much hatred can play is a question. Yogi Adityanath too is now talking about development. I, well, or development of claiming, what we don't know. Yes. As we saw, non-productive assets like statues. Statues. Perhaps. I mean, if you want to have a statue bigger than the statue of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, which is in Gujarat, in Ayodhya or Faisabad, will that make a difference? The changing of names. More and more people asking, din ka hai? where are the good times? More and more people are saying, what happened to all the black money that you were supposed to bring? from abroad, then you described it as a Chunawi Jumla. People are asking this question, where are the jobs that you promised us? 
Instead of that, you had a botched up way in which you implemented the goods and services tax. You disrupted the economy by demonetization, hurting the weakest sections of the population, the women, senior citizens, the children who are dependent on women, daily wage laborers, small shopkeepers and traders, farmers. Who still bore with it in the belief that jobs would come. When it didn't, I think it's boomeranged. I think in the coming months we will know. And when elections take place in April, May, assuming they will take place as per schedule, the 17th general elections, uh, we will see what will happen. But I have a feeling and uh, my instinct tells me that what happened in 2014 and what will happen in 2019 would be very different. For the first time in 2014, the party which got a majority in the Lok Sabha, the lower house of parliament with 282 seats, got 31.4% of the vote. But 90% of all the votes that the BJP got were stacked in 60% of the Lok Sabha constituency. That means in out of 543, in 299, 90% of all the votes that the BJP got were there. And the remaining 10% were scattered over 40% of the constituencies. This is what Praveen Chakravarti of the Congress describes as a black swan moment. Ornithologists always thought all swans were white until they actually saw a black swan. Can this happen again? It seems most unlikely. Will once again 2019 be fought on personalities rather than issues? Can, 2014 became akin to an American-style presidential election. That was Trump versus Clinton. This was Modi versus Rahul. Will that happen again? Or will issues, issues like joblessness, the agrarian crisis, the, the undermining of institutions matter? I would like to believe the second will matter more, but time alone can tell, Praveen. Thank you very much, Paranja, for being with us. Let's hope that this does not become a matter of personalities, but a matter of politics, political issues. And this is what the parliamentary system is supposed to be, unlike a presidential system, which tends to personalize the election. Very happy New Year to you, Prabhi, and to News to Newsclick. And our viewers. This is all the time we have today. We'll come back next year again for our year's roundup. So this is goodbye to 2018 and the beginning of 2019, hopefully a better year.